So people ask us all the time, can you make wine from table grapes? The unequivocal answer is yes, you absolutely can, but will it taste good? Let's find out. Part of the reason why there's a question at all is because table grapes are made for eating, not really for fermenting, where wine grapes are usually smaller, a lot sweeter, with a more concentrated sugar content. Therefore, you don't need as many to be able to make sugar. That's why we got 21 pounds of table grapes from Costco that we now have to rinse, clean, and prepare to ferment. So the first step is we have to open up some of these packages, well, <laughs> all of them, and remove the stems from the grapes. Aren't they pretty grapes, though? So if you're curious, these are Sweetums Red Seedless Grapes. From Costco. They did not lie. They are sweet and yummy. It was at this moment that I started to wonder if maybe we have too many grapes. You see, I based it off of some information that I found on the internet where they said 20 pounds of grapes makes a gallon of wine. And I thought, okay, 21 will be good, just in case there's a few bad ones, plus the stems and vines and all that weigh a little bit. Not realizing that the water content of this grape is almost double, or close to double, what it is of a wine grape. So, looks like I'm gonna be eating some grapes for a while. Maybe, we'll see. We got a lot of grapes. So I went ahead and got our juicer out, and I went ahead and I sanitized each of the elements. Even the tray and that catches the waste product, because in our case, there is not going to be any waste. Now, we did rinse our grapes after we plucked them from the vine, and just to go an extra step further, we actually dumped them into our sanitizer liquid. So that way, any surface baddies that may have been on there after rinsing them are completely annihilated. Kapow! By the way, we, we only have about 12 pounds of grapes done so far. Yeah. I just thought, you know, this is starting to look like a lot. Let's start getting some of this into the fermenter and get it juiced and we'll move forward. The sanitizer has been sanitized. The sanitizer. The fermenter has been sanitized too. So the too. fermenter has been sanitized, <laughs> our juicer has been sanitized, and our grapes have been sanitized, as well as my hands. Let's, let's get, get to juicing. Let's get to juicing, that's what I was about to say. Juice it. <laughs> Allez, juicer. <laughs> we started watching the new Iron Chef on Netflix. I, it's wacky. The chairman is more crazy than I remember. I mean, I, this goes up to 11. Yeah, this goes to 12, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so this is a gravity spin juicer. So basically it's just gonna spin around like crazy and it's got a grinding element on the bottom. Juice is gonna come out here, waste is gonna come out there. It is gonna be really loud, so I'm gonna stop talking now. It also spits. Didn't know that. We have juice. I'll just leave a towel here. <laughs> this may take a while. Non più dry farfalon yamoroso, not te giorno di torno girano. If you are juicing at home along with us, make sure not to push pressure onto your plunger. You want to just kind of hold it steady and let gravity do the work. But otherwise, you may burn out your motor. Also, if you find that your grapes are perhaps lighter in density than ours, you may have an excess of the pulp remaining with the skins in your offshoot. One thing we didn't mention, these are seedless grapes too. Yeah. That may make a difference for your juicer. Uh, I don't know if you want to try juicing the seeds. I don't know, some juicers might pull them out, some might not. So if you find you have an excess of pulp remaining on your skins, you can take that and reduce it to try to get more juice out. But we're putting it in anyway. So yeah, it won't matter. So it won't matter.
up being quite a mess. And oh God, yeah. one of the things that we have learned as our experienced home brewers is that one of the best things, one of the best things you can have in your personality, in your ability. One thing. Everything was sanitized in. The big bucket of sanitization! That's what was just dripping all over me. <laughs> anyway, go I did, on. I did that extra crazy just for some special viewers out there. Um, but yeah, be flexible. Learn how Move to just off. go with the flow because you might have an idea at the beginning and then this might happen. And as you can see, we did complete juicing all of our grapes. Oh yeah, that is 21 pounds of grape juice. But there is no room for any of the solids. We had foam on top of foam on top of foam. We, so we did this process where I juiced them and then the juicer cup has this little thing to prevent foam from flowing when you pour it. It doesn't work. It, not in this particular instance. This has worked in the past, but not, not for grapes. So then we put it in there and we were hoping it would dissipate. It did not. It was very resilient foam. So then we put a brew bag, a very fine mesh brew bag in our favorite pitcher. And then Brian dumped this into that and then put, then we rinsed this out because the foam was Basically, just- Basically we used a brew bag as like a sieve. Yes. And then I squeezed the bag for like 20 minutes to get all the juice out. This isn't all of it. There was probably another like half a pint, but I'm done. But rather than looking at this as an issue, we're going to look at this as an opportunity. An opportunity to, to tell everybody why we don't use table grapes to make wine, right? No, no. we're going to attempt to make white wine oh, from that, yeah. red grapes. Because here's the thing, if you use the whole grape, meaning the skin seeds, stems even, and the juice, you make red wine. Well, if you don't use the stems and seeds and vines and all that kind of stuff, you make white wine. Now, they probably use a different method to mechanically separate the right. juice from the pulp. So we may end up with a pink wine. I, I, I a rosé. <laughs> yeah, it's a rosé. And that's fine. Um, but anyway, I wanted to get a gravity reading. So here is our gravity reading. It's actually kind of impressive. I did not expect this. 1.080. That's not bad. That means... Given the way we do things, that's like 10 to 11 percent. That's just with fine. With just juice. We didn't add any sugars. Yep. We didn't add any water. It's, it's just, just juice. juice from table grapes. Impressive, actually. This is an aspect of brewing that we gloss over probably a little too much. Um, let me get my note papers. And it is very important to take notes on your brews. Okay, we just use a piece of paper that we cut into strips. Derek cuts them into strips. And I'm going to call this table juice wine. And what are the important facts that I put in this? The date. Today is June 21st, 2022. I will usually put the starting gravity at the top too. This was 1.080. Then I'll start listing ingredients. For this, it was 21 pounds of Costco grapes. We're just going to say that. Run through the juicer. Juiced. Because it is just the juice. Now, could you just do the shortcut and buy the juice and make this? Well, Absolutely. We've well, even we done want, a video on that. Yeah, we just wanted to see, can you do this with table ju table grapes and see if it'd be any good? Um, to this, we're also going to add some Fermato. Now, I was debating on using Fermato in this particular one, even though I know it's probably a good idea all the time. But once we sieved everything out, that mesh bag was really fine. That means all the fine particles were gone. There was just juice. Yeah, you know what? Nutrients, probably a good idea. If we were able to leave all the chewed up pulp and skins and everything, I might not have needed it, but I'm gonna do it. It's not a super high gravity, but eh, probably won't hurt. So two grams. Two grams and a little bit of water. Hopefully there's room. Then Derica chose our yeast. Yes, and so I have chosen this yeast. This is Red Star. Côté de Blanc. Premier Côté de Blanc. Uh, so I actually researched this. I looked this up with my handy dandy the research computer tool that we'll never have handy. <laughs> I grew up looking in the encyclopedia for stuff, okay, folks? So this is like cool. And so this is suited for aromatic whites and Chardonnays, particularly where some residual sugar is desired. Do, do, do. It just flipped on me. It always does that, doesn't it, though? 
it's slower fermenting. Uh, it's a low foaming yeast. We have plenty of foam, so that seemed like a good idea. Right, this is gonna it is characterized by fine fruity aromatics, as I said before. It has an alcohol tolerance of 13%. So we're safe. It's probably gonna go dry, most likely. Most likely. It's also made by Red Star, which means it's a terrible packet, which is to say that it's it not doesn't terrible. It does tear. Yeah, that. Got to use another tool. They also say that it is suited for aromatic whites, chardonnays, particularly where some residual sugar is desired, light young reds, and sparkling cuvee. So we, it, based on that description alone, it sounded like all our bases were covered. This is going to be like a white, young red, that kind of thing. Yeah, we're good. So I'm just going to use a whole packet. And what am I doing? Thwack your packet! Got to get all those yeasty beasties in there. I know there's one left. All right. And I'm just going to give it a little stir. Get that in there with the wuss, the whisk of unusually small size. <laughs> now, this is the thin film gasket, the foam gasket that sits inside of the lid that creates the seal for this particular fermenter. And so I left it out on purpose to show people, because I have heard some people say they accidentally threw theirs away. Don't throw it away. This is what's going to create the seal. You can get new ones, though. They sell you can more. get new ones. And some viewers have actually said that they've stacked them to make a thicker foam layer, which may help with your seal as well. Mm. I'm just going to tighten this down a little bit more, something like that. OK, what are we going to do now? We're going to let it sit. But we are going to let it sit in a baking sheet with lips. Just happen to have it ready. Those edges are going to help collect any spillage that may occur if this becomes an active fermentation, which... This was messy already. Yeah. So we're not taking any chances. No. I'm thinking blow off tube is in this thing's future. <laughs> we will let you know as this video progresses, but for now, if I sound a little bit frustrated, it's only because we just spent the last two to two and a half hours picking and juicing grapes. My hands are sticky, okay? They've been sticky for like two hours. <laughs> if anyone ever asks why we don't make tape, yeah. If anyone ever asks why we don't use whole fruit, this is why, okay? Although I did think of something as we were doing this. In the middle of it, we were probably three quarters of the way through and I said, you know, probably could have just used the blender. Yes, we could have also rinsed them really well and then popped them in the freezer for like a, a right. day. I think we would have had too many grapes because yeah. this is actually a gallon and a half now. Okay, that's true. So if if you go that route, you could probably get away with like 15, 15 pounds of grapes, which is fine. I just went off that 20 pounds just to see. Sure. And hey, you know what? They're not far off. I And I think because these are larger grapes, they're more water content, they're not as sugared, yeah, that's where it came from. And this route allowed us to get a gravity reading on just the grapes, where oh, yeah. if we froze them, there would be no way to get a yeah, gravity reading. Yeah, if we ran it through the blender, we wouldn't have been able to do it. We'd have to strain it through the yeah. bag, and we'd end yeah. up with much the same thing, I think. I don't I don't really know how much different they would be. But anyway, one, one thing that we didn't really touch on is the reason why it's kind of a weird thing. is because wine grapes are different. But when you make a wine, like if you make a Pinot Noir, you're using a specific kind of grapes. When you make a Cabernet, you're using Cabernet grapes. That's the real key. What kind of grapes were these? Sweet something, something. Sweet I mean, and yummy. Yeah, I mean, they're <laughs> not really a vintage of grape used a varietal. That's the word. They're yep. not a varietal of grape that's typically used to make wines. So it may be less than a great wine. We don't really know. We're going to find out. So but we'll find out and we'll share deal. that information with you. Okay, nine days in. Not a lot of activity in the airlock. Time for its first check. First check is done the same as the original gravity reading. So really, really simple. Just, you know, use a hydrometer with a Mega Maid like we do. Put it in the graduated cylinder, get the reading. 0.994. So what we're going to do now is put this sample back in because everything has been sanitized and we don't like to waste anything. And we're going to wait one week and check it again. One thing I would like to take note of is the color. It's not what I expected at all. I thought for sure it wasn't going to go white because, you know, there was enough mashed up skins and stuff because of the pulping process and the juicing process. But it's almost like orangey, like a rosy orange. It's yeah, a little bit odd. It is really bizarre. And 
something that occurred during the process of it fermenting that was even more bizarre is that it turned into like a milk-like consistency. It was really weird. Which was really, really kind of off-putting. So if you are doing a similar thing and you come across that, it's completely okay. It's just part of the proteins being fermented and reallocating. It smells like wine. So we're gonna add our reading, today's date, on our notes, and we'll see you in a week. All right, so we let this go about six days, and it's time to take a second reading. When we last left it, it was at 0.994. That's 0 0.994 for those of you keeping track at home. And I'm expecting, based on that being so low, that this is probably done. But, you know, we always like to make sure. The number one thing that we get asked in comments and in the VIP is, did I rack too soon? How come my brew is stuck at 1.050? I racked it after four days. We get that all the time. And I'm not picking on anybody for this because a lot of recipes actually say, let ferment for a week, then rack. They actually tell you things like that. Well, we, we found yeast can't read and different brews work different ways and may have different fermenting times. And it could be up to a month or more sometimes. So don't take that as a verbatim. That's why we like to take a reading once things slow down, wait a week, take another reading if they are the same. And if they are in the range of normality where you expect that it should be done, then it's probably done. What I mean by that is, well, you know what? I have a video that explains all of that and how to determine approximately where it should end and how. So we'll have a link to that. 0 0.994. Okay, so this is totally, totally done. So let me make a note of that. So now that we've indicated that our brew has completed fermentation, now is the appropriate time to rack. This is another thing that comes up all the time. Do we have to rack? Do you have to take it out of here? Do you have to bottle? Technically, no, though I highly recommend it. If you do not rack, you have all the leaves and solids and things like that in the bottom they have a chance to come back up and get disturbed and it could be a problem. Can you literally just scoop a cup in here and take a drink? Absolutely you can. The problem is storage. It's gonna be more difficult to store it. That's why bottling comes into play. You don't necessarily wanna store it in your fermenter, but bottles are nice and easy and serving sizes, things like that. If you start getting more headroom in here, you have a greater chance of oxidation as time goes on. So that's why a bottle, smaller serving size works better. All right, so I poured the sample into the uh, next Big Mouth Bubbler, because if you could see, this is really, really full, but I did save a tiny little bit. I will say the color changed drastically. It started that very, very like reddish, and then it started going milky. Yeah. And then it, we thought it was gonna go totally clear. I think it's because the mashing up process, the pulping process, leaves a little bit of skin in there, so that's why it got a little bit of red color, but I'm just gonna take a quick swig. Okay, this is literally like two weeks old. It's not bad. It's got a good juicy grape flavor and it's very dry. Yeah. I also did the quick alco uh, alcohol calculation. We had 1.080 to start, went down to 0.994. That gives us 86 points. 86 points times 135 gives me 11.61. I'm gonna call that about 11.5% ABV. That's pretty respectable since there's no extra sugar, there's no honey, there's no other sweeteners, just frozen grapes. But as we said, we're gonna rack this now. Racking simply means getting it from one container to another, getting it off those lees, getting it to be more of just the wine itself, the way we want it to be packaged, if you will. These grapes weren't frozen. You're right, these grapes were not frozen. <laughs> this was the, the craziness at Costco, we got some funny looks buying all those grapes. <laughs> People were like, what are they doing with all those I mean, you know, I'm pretty sure somebody went, I like grapes as much as the next guy, but... But it's pretty amazing that just from grapes, we were able to get that much sugar. So that's yeah. pretty awesome. And I've always heard, you know, that table grapes are not the best for making wine. And I can understand it because uh, wine grapes have been bred for that and they're made specifically for it. But based on my initial taste of that? There is an interesting thing that, and researching the specific varietals of different types of fruit that are bred specifically for fermenting, their flavor profile eating fresh versus 
what are bread for eating are very different. Mm. So like the apples that are specific for apple cider are very tart. And yeah, they don't taste good. They don't taste good. The peri pears, they're very tart and they don't taste good. Um, but wine grapes are uber sweet. Right, but when I, when I took the sample of this, it tasted like dry wine. And then I got the grape juice flavor. Oh yeah, it's fruity. That you fruity. don't typically get so much where you think, oh, that's grape juice yeah. from wine. Oh, uh, so that could be the difference there is that it has that, that grapey taste. Yeah. My initial expectation when we saw 0.994 on this was, oh, we're gonna have to back sweeten, but I don't know, we might not have to. We are gonna let this sit in conditioning for a while yeah. before we really make that determination, but so far so good. I'll say this too, the lees compacted really, really nicely at the bottom. The liquid is nice and clear all the way to the bottom. There's no like turbidity. There's no, um, you know, wispies going all over the place. There's little bits of skin floating around and some of that's being sucked up by the um, auto siphon, but that's okay. This is the first rack. It's all right. It's still gonna settle out. It's gonna get racked one more time. Very, very little waste here. Let me show you. See if I just tilt that, look at that. I mean, that's <laughs> a few tablespoons of wastage. And I wouldn't even really call that waste because it's pretty nasty. Though we do know somebody that likes to drink that. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> and the next step is cover it up. Just put the lid back on with airlock. We just used the same lid from before. There was no reason to worry about it. And we wanna tighten this down really good. And I'm gonna give this a little bit of a swirl. You should see some activity. Yeah, there was, there was quite a bit of gas. The off-gassing will actually help with flavor. It'll help if there's any little bits of sugar left for fermentation, which I really doubt, it can help with that too. But mostly it's to help with the flavor and help uh, clear it up a little bit more. So uh, what are we gonna do with this now? We're gonna let it sit. See you in a couple weeks. Okay, so it's been another week. Now, ideally, you like to let stuff sit for a while. This is looking like it's clearing out pretty well. We're running out of room in the fermentation station, so it's time to get this one moving. Um, it can clear out a little bit more in the bottle, and I'm actually okay with that. But for today, what we need to do is our tasting. That's right, we're gonna do the tasting before we bottle it. We talked about this in another video that you may or may not have seen yet. I'm not sure if this comes out before that or not. And the reason being, we did so many of these tastings, we went, oh, what if we had done this? Or what if we had done that? Well, now we're gonna do the tasting first. We're gonna give this a score, and then we're gonna say, does it need anything? And are we going to do anything to change it up? This so is the weirdest way to pour glasses. So many of you gave us some really great ideas on what to call it. And the most common was, a P word. Preliminary. It wasn't preliminary, it was like pre... The pre-bottle. It was a fancy word. I, I, I'm, it's, it's, lost the, it's left the building. But anyway, that word. So we're just gonna call it preliminary today. The P taste. <laughs> you know that's a t-shirt in, in the works right there. Have you done the P taste yet? <laughs> okay, okay. Approximately equal in dignity. Um, can we have the airlock back before we start? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, we put the airlock back on because uh, a lot of times people have said, and they're not wrong, talking over it and things like that could induce oxygen, infections, that sort of thing. I highly doubt it at this stage of the game, but it is possible, so better safe than sorry. The color, it is a pretty... It's like a rosé. It's like a rosé. It's peachy. It's a very pale rosé, yeah. actually. Yeah. It's like a white rosé. It's there, not really white. There's like, I think there's like a pink champagne, and this kind of reminds me of sure. that. Sure. Now this fermented down to 0.994, okay, which puts this to 11.6% alcohol, right smack in the middle of a normal wine range. Um, it's basically just grapes, fermato and um, yeast, that's it. I'm getting a lot of youth on the I'm getting a lot bouquet. of grape on the bouquet. I get some youth. There's definitely a little bit of um, what, I, what I term the grapefruit scent, which is kind of like a young green wine smell. Yeah. Not a lot, but it's there. Now this is very, very dry, so we'll see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna taste it. Oh, 
Wow, you know. Okay, hold on a second. All right, time to take a little trip. As this enters the palate, the florally kind of almost grapefruit flavors give way to strawberry. That's what I am tasting as it enters is strawberry. So it's like a straw grape. So I get strawberry, a little bit of sweetness even. It's really odd. This is not sweet, yet I get sweetness. As it enters the mouth, now I get a little bit of that astringency from the tannins, just a touch of astringency, not, not a tremendous amount. Um, the, the acid level is pretty good, I think. Um, and then it goes to sweetness again for me, and then it's a very quick, clean finish. It's actually really nice. It tastes like a wine. Well, it is. I know it's a ridiculous thing for me to say, but I'm just, I'm... Tastes like white wine. It tastes like a commercially made wine. Yeah. Like all the different levels that a dry wine can bring to you. Yeah. I'm getting from this. I which, just got apricot and peach. Which I wasn't expecting from no. just a table grape wine. I totally get like a strawberry on the front and apricot and peach towards the end. This is this is actually quite nice. I'm I'm actually really happy with this. I don't think I want to do anything to it. For a dry wine, particularly one that you'd want to pair with food or even cook with in your food. Oh, for sauces and this stuff. Would this would be lovely. Be amazing. I'm I am taken aback. <laughs> now remember the whole point behind this was we've all been told if you want to make good wine, you got to use the best grapes. And while I'm sure that is actually true, had we had a real varietal of grapes that was supposedly very, very good for making wine, we probably would have made a, a better wine than we did. That time I got almost the buttery sensation that you get from Chardonnay. Chardonnay, yeah. There's, there's a lot of complexity in this that I did not expect at all. And I think that's something that you get from using the whole fruits that we don't get when we use juice. Because, I mean, grape juice that you buy is Concord grapes. It's not the most highfalutin type of grape out there, you know, for and making we're stuff. Trying, we're starting to see this more often across more. the board in all of our different beverages, but whether it be a wine, a cider, a mead, they all seem to have a little extra something when we go through the effort of using actual whole fruit. I think it's because, you know, just like we learned from being whole foods people now, uh, when you use the whole fruit, you're getting everything. You're getting the skin, the seeds, the pulp, the, the juice. Right. You know, everything. And there's no extras added, so it's unadulterated, too. Yeah, I think that using the whole fruit inherently gives you the complexity that you're looking for in a beverage. Yeah. Now, this is all speculation, but we've, no, there's, we've seen there's it. There's definitely some truth to that. We've seen it multiple times in multiple Absolutely. styles of beverages. And so I'm really starting to think. Well, it comes up a lot. People ask us, what's better, the fruit or the juice? And now I'd have to say that the fruit is definitely better. Yeah. Like without a doubt, the fruit is better. Is the fruit easier? No, no. it's annoying. It's almost Messy. always gonna be harder to <laughs> use the fruit. Now you could just freeze them and throw them in, crush them. You could do that sort of thing too. Um, I don't know that you'd get as good of an extraction rate that way. You might get a, di you'll get a different product because remember we did this through the juicer. So the skins and seeds were left behind for the most part. Some got through obviously by the color. Yeah. Had we just thrown them in and mashed them, we'd probably have a red wine. It would taste very, very different. Right. And if we just mashed them and then took all the pulp away, we would probably have a white wine. Yep. And that's, that's the main differences there. I gotta say though, I'm pretty pleased with this. Like, I'm actually starting to think of, okay, what can we do with this now? Can we take this and add other fruits to it and make fruity oh, flavor? Sure. I mean, the strawberry thing is working. It, yeah, I totally get that. And you taste strawberries too? Yeah. Okay, so there you have it. That happens with wine and well, food in general. Your brain tries to fill in the blanks when it doesn't know what something is. It t says, oh, You've had this before, it tastes like this. I think because it's dry, but that initial taste, like you were saying, you still get the- There's a the, florally the, sweetness there. The sweet, juicy thing. And so your brain goes, okay, what is tart yet sweet? 
Mm -hmm. Strawberry. Yeah. It, it doesn't taste like strawberry wine, don't get me wrong. But it definitely has a strawberry uh, influence, if mm -hmm. you will. It, it's not super strong, but it's definitely there. And then later on, I'm kind of getting the peach sensation that you yep. mentioned. I was, I'm not really getting apricot so much, but I could see where the transition between strawberry mm -hmm. to peach might read as apricot. Yeah, it's that astringent yeah. kind of thing yeah. coming through. Um, but there's a funny thing that's happening for me in drinking this, is I'm actually getting hungry. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> because my brain is like, oh, you could drink that with You this are very dish much about pairing, though. You yeah. really, she likes to like take a bite of the food and then have a sip of the wine that she paired with it to enhance the flavors. And you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I think it's kind of awesome. I don't have that kind of self-control. It's like, you know. Um, but she does that, and that's why she's getting hungry. She has a Pavlovian response to drinking mm -hmm. wine now. That's not a good thing. <laughs> but um, well, it's, I think it's better for me to drink wine and become hungry mm. rather than eat food and become thirsty for wine. That is true. <laughs> Absolutely. I would have to agree with that. All right, it is time to put a score on this. All right, so Mr. Parameter, what, what is your mental parameter for how we should be judging this? All right. The way we're going to score this one today is a scale of 1 through 10. 10 being the highest, 1 being the lowest. Probably won't be seeing an 11 today. Just saying. 11 is reserved for the absolute most amazing thing ever when we've already given a 10 and it just has to be better than that. Instead, 10 just means this is incredible. Like, if I had... 20 things in front of me and I knew this was there, I'd probably choose this over those other things. One means possibly toxic. After we shut off the camera, we'd probably dump it down the drain. <laughs> then in between is, you know, one and a half through, ten, through nine and a half. That's varying levels of, I drink it to mm, not so much, okay? Um, I am judging this as it is, as a wine. As a wine. This is exactly, uh, wow, 21 days old today. This is three weeks old, fresh, whole grape juice, whole grape wine, not just juice, whole grape wine from Costco. No fancy schmancy grapes here. These are Costco grapes, okay? I think the I'm, label I'm little, just said table grapes. I don't know if yeah, they just said anything. It was other sweet than just, something, just, I don't know. I, I'm. I'm kind of taken back. I really didn't think it was going to be any good. I, I, I figured, eh, it'd be okay. No, this is actually pretty nice wine. Like, I could serve this to somebody and they'd be like, oh, what vintage is this, you know? It is uh, 2022. I mean, I can make up some name, like Costco backwards or something with a, with a number on it, you know? But whatever. Um, I, I, I have a number. Okay, I do too. One, two, three, seven. eight. Seven. I was debating between seven and a half and eight that time. So I gave this a seven because it, this isn't the type of thing that I would typically go for right. immediately. I'm, I'm not a huge dry wine enthusiast, though it's growing on me, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when it comes to food pairings. And as Brian said, I'm all about that. So that's that pushed it up to the seven mark for me, where typically I'd probably give this more of like a six. Uh, but beyond that, I am honestly shocked by the complexity of this beverage. It was a really simple build, if you want to call mm -hmm. it. And to have all those different notes that I wasn't expecting come forward, I, I probably should actually give this a 7.5, to be honest. Uh, it's, it, it is... It has taken me aback, and I'm pleasantly surprised, and I like to be pleasantly surprised. I went eight and no higher because I like things a little sweeter. If this was a little sweeter, I'd probably go higher, but I'm not going to sweeten it, and here's why. This is three weeks old. At a year, this is probably oh, going to be yeah. smooth and mellow and <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> We need to have at least one bottle last a year, oh, yeah. and then let's do a two-year on this, because okay. I think a two-year, yeah. this is going to be really amazing. We're not going to do two years on everything, just certain ones, ones that we think either will improve greatly or are just so incredible that we want to preserve that for a two-year tasting. But this is one of those that I think it's going to get better over time. 
it's already quite good. You can serve this right now and people go, wow, that's actually pretty nice. And even if they didn't know it was three weeks old, it just sounds absurd to think that way, but it was a nice clean fermentation. It yeah. happened fairly quickly. It, it, it's a thing. It's a thing. And if you think about it, a grape is a grape is a grape. Yes, there are different varieties with subtle nuances that make them different and work better in different scenarios. But if you think about yeast, Yeast is yeast is yeast, and I know that's a very controversial topic. Well... And all the hate mail is going to point out at me and stuff, but it's the same critter, people, okay? Yeah, they're all Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And so they have subtle nuances as well to work in different alcohol tolerances, to work in different temperatures, to have different esters and different flavor imparts. Sure. But they're very subtle. So the fact that we made a fairly decent wine from a table grape rather than a specific varietal grape, if you think about it, really isn't that shocking. Fair enough. You know what it's time to do though? Let's bottle this. Bottling. As always, what we're gonna do, we're gonna take the cap off of the fermenter first, and we're going to use an auto siphon to move it from the fermenter into the bottles. Really, really simple. Some of our bottles are repurposed, AKA it used to hold a different beverage. We drank that beverage and now we're using them again. That is the best way to get bottles because you can either look at it that you got a free bottle that you can use again, or whatever beverage came in it the first time was free because you bought the bottle. <laughs> we are also gonna be using our bottling wand attached to our auto siphon. And did I forget to get that out? You forgot to get that I out. I forgot to get that out. Because everything has been sanitized. What's a bottling wand you ask? Good question. It is basically a rod of plastic that has a valve at the end that some of them are spring operated, some of them are gravity fed. I prefer the spring operated one. You put that in the bottom of the bottle, it lets the fluid flow. If you lift it up, it stops it. That way you don't have to try crimping off the tubing or anything like that to stop the flow while you're bottling. You just have to make sure that your helper or your third hand, as yeah. it may be, pushes that down so that it's activated when you start plunging with your auto siphon. Now, I'm leaving the cap on this time because we do have a little bit of fine leaves in the bottom here. I could have racked it to a pitcher and then rack again, but the more you rack it, the more chances you are for you have for oxygenating. So we're gonna just, you know, go right from fermenter to bottle, no problem. And I just wanna get this started. We going? Yep. And then I'm gonna let this fall to the bottom of the fermenter very carefully so as to not disturb any of that lees, and I'll take over bottling. We'll see you when we're done. So as you can see, we have a lovely assortment of vessels here. We have mostly 750 ml bottles. One of these is gonna go away for a year. Another one's gonna go away for two years. And then we have a glass. You might think, yeah, you guys are just gonna drink that. Well, actually, I'm making sausage and peppers tonight, and I'm gonna put probably half that glass into the sauce. The other half, we're gonna drink with it, because the wine that you cook with should be the wine that you drink the food with as well, because that way they pair nicely together, and it brings out the aromas and the flavors. But, as always, guys, thanks so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.